good start. Oh, okay, that's probably thrown out everything. I tripped on the power cable to the light. <sighs> so I, I have no idea what the composition's like now because I don't have one of those flippy screens. But anyway, you may have seen in the news that uh, Magawa, a rat, won the PDSA gold medal for animal valor and dedication to service. I actually had the, the privilege and the pleasure of spending a day with Magawa and the 13 other rats that he works with, along with their handlers and trainers. And I would argue that Magawa should instead be nominated for a Nobel Prize. I mean, if Donald Trump can get a nomination, then why not this rat? So um, yeah, hang around. I'll show you the photos from that day. I'm going to tell you all about their work because this is something that's really, really important to know about. So it should be looking much better there now. All right, anyway, according to the landmine detecting NGO Halo Trust, in Cambodia since 1979, there have been over 64,000 casualties and over 25,000 amputees that are the result of uncleared landmines or unexploded ordnance from the various wars in and around Cambodia over the years. And there were an estimated 6 million landmines all around the country. Now many of them have been cleared but there are still so many that need to be cleared. And there's whole areas of land that are completely useless because it's just not safe to venture onto them. So there are a number of NGOs that have gone to Cambodia or been established in Cambodia to help clear these areas of land so that it can be returned to the communities and used for farming or other useful things again. Now, two of those NGOs are Apopo, which is a Belgian NGO that's been involved in clearing landmines in Africa a lot, and also CMAC, which is Cambodian Mine Action Center. And these two have, in recent years, been collaborating to bring in hero rats to clear the landmines. So why rats? Well, these giant African pouch rats are so light that they don't trigger the landmines when they walk on them. Even more importantly than that, their sense of smell is so acute that they can detect the explosives in the landmines up to 13 centimeters below the surface. So while humans would have to go in with metal detectors, and those metal detectors are going to detect landmines, but they're also going to detect shrapnel and other bits of metal that are in the soil. So it actually takes a really, really long time to clear a relatively small area of land. So these rats, can clear around 200 square meters of land in about 20 minutes. Now humans with metal detectors would take between one and four days to clear that same amount of land, depending on the amount of shrapnel that's in the soil. So these rats are extremely effective, but they need to learn how to do their work. So I actually went to the center where they were doing their training because they need to go through about a year of training before they can go into the field. So I'm gonna show you a day in the life of these rats, their handlers and their trainers in the training center. So when I visited the center, the first thing I noticed was that when you go into the room where they keep the rats, basically there's 14 rats in there all in their own separate enclosures, but there's no smell in there. It's really clean because they actually clean them out regularly on a daily basis, even multiple times each day. And even the wood shavings that they use, they make themselves from scratch. So everything's done on site. But anyway, the rat's day actually starts really early in the morning because the rats are nocturnal. So they're usually active during the night and daytimes when they sleep. So they get up basically just at dawn when the rats are just at the tail end of their waking hours, go out onto the field and do some training. So first they took the cats out in their own containers to the field. And at that time, Shirama Vendeling was there from Tanzania training the Cambodian workers and handlers how to actually handle the rats and detect the mines. So he gave them a bit of a talk and then they headed out onto the field. And on the field they had roped off sections where they'd previously hidden some explosive material 
under the ground. But they also buried some other things, some dummy mines, just to make sure that the rats were smelling the explosives and not smelling other things or noticing the disturbed dirt or anything like that. So basically, when they take the rats out, they attach a, a harness to the rats and then the rat moves along a wire between two people either side of the field and they guide it from one end to the other and when it reaches the other side then they move along one step and then the rat comes back the other way and it zigzags along the entire area and it can cover about 200 square meters in 20 minutes. Now when the rat actually detects a landmine and when it smells that explosive material then it will stop and it will scratch at the earth and so once it's scratching at the earth they'll click a little clicker that they have and that's when the rat knows that it's time for a reward because the rats really love bananas and peanuts so when the rat finds some explosive material they'll click the clicker and then the rat will run back to the owner and they'll give it a banana or some peanuts and so they do this and at the end of the day if the rat has discovered all of the explosives then it gets a hundred percent mark and trains the next day again they're actually required to have a 100 percent success rate so if they miss any of the mines or if they dig at something that's not a mine then they get an X next to their name and they'll have to train even longer. So they're, they're quite strict with it because basically people's lives are relying on these rats. But the thing that I noticed on the day was that the rats are very much in control. They're the bosses. So sometimes the rats would just decide, okay, I'm done, I've, I've, I'm tired, I've done enough work for the day and they'll stop. You usually notice this when they start cleaning themselves. They'll just stop and stop preening themselves and uh, that's pretty much the end of the day for that particular rat. So once they get tired, you can't really make them work. They, they know who's in control. The rats are the boss. Um, the handlers guide them and work with them, but the rats are the ones that decide whether they're going to work or not. But there is actually a relationship that develops between the handlers and the rats. Um, now the rats will work with anybody, they're not like the dogs, but the, the, the rats and the handlers do, they do become close. And so it was really interesting seeing the interactions between the rats and the handlers as well. But really at this time they were training the rats, but they were also training the handlers so that they could have the most success when they went out and started detecting mines and obviously it's what because now they've cleared a lot of land. Magawa alone has cleared around 141,000 square meters of land. That's about 20 football fields, 39 mines and 28 items of unexploded ordnance. So he's done a great job but the other rats have all you know, had their fair quota as well. Um, Magawa is just the one that found more than the other rats, uh, he's, so he's the one that got the award. But really, they've all earned it. As well as the handlers. The handlers really are unsung heroes. Once they've finished training, that's not the end of the day because the handlers then have to do a few things. Firstly, they clean up the area where the rats are living. Um, the rats are really, really well looked after. But the other thing they have to do is they have to tabulate or note down all of the results from the training that morning. Now, when I saw them do that, they went into this room and the room was actually a combination of living quarters, office space, and storage. So, you know, the facilities are actually really, really simple. Um, they're not putting a lot of money into you know, things like that kind of infrastructure. They're putting all of their money into actually getting out and doing the job. So it was interesting seeing them, you know, sitting on beds doing their work and, and with the beds right next to the desk. So the office, the bed, living quarters, it's, it's all the one room. So they have two rooms that they use. I, I assume one for the males, one for the females, because there are a number of female handlers as well. But once they've done all of that, then it's lunchtime. So they go out and prepare a meal. Now, 
You know what, at this facility, they don't even have running water. They actually bring in the water in big containers. And so when they're cooking, when they're washing vegetables, when they're washing dishes, all of these things are done with that water. So it's very, very simple. I assume by this point in time, they've you know, established that facility a little more because when I went, it was four years ago. Um, but I'm sure that you know, the facilities are a little better. But you know what, they were so happy because everybody just really got along and there was a real sense that it was like a kind of family. You know, the rats, well, one thing, but the workers, the, the rat handlers and the trainers, they all just got along like a big family and it was a really great atmosphere. So I really enjoyed my time out there. It seems that Shirima, the Tanzanian trainer, wasn't quite used to Cambodian food, however. So uh, I did see a couple of interesting moments with him dealing with uh, the food that they were cooking. But you know what? Everybody just had a really good time. And uh, you know, the thing is that they're doing really, really important work. And so if you think that this is something that you'd like to support, you can actually go to the Apopo website and they have a lot of options. You can adopt a rat, you can make a donation to you know, clear a certain area of land. There's lots of things you can do. And if you go to Siem Reap, in Cambodia, you can actually also visit their facility. Um, and so, you know, there's a number of ways that you can support them in doing their work because it really, really is such important work. All right, so yeah, this is the, the perks of being a documentary photographer is you get to experience all of these different things. It's really, really great. So in this channel, I will be speaking a lot about the different things that I've seen over the years, but also some things about documentary photography itself and how do you get into it if that's something that you wanna do and how do you do documentary photography? Of course, besides that, I know that a lot of people came to this channel because they're interested in Brisbane and things to do around there. I will still be putting some of that material in here, as well as some general photography stuff. Um, but thanks for watching to the end again. Um, yep, if you're not subscribing, do that. Give it a thumbs up if you liked it. If you hated it, give it a thumbs down. And let me know what kinds of things you'd like to see in this channel. And uh, I will see you in the next video.